Okay, everyone. Thank you very much. This is Todd Stout with First Watch, and um, we're very proud to have uh, one of our uh, longest-running customers um, presenting how they're using technology to enhance their QI and QA process. Um, again, this is Todd Stout with First Watch. We do have folks coming in and joining the system um, literally right now, and um, we uh, encourage you to uh, continue to do that. The session is recorded, and so if you're not comfortable with that, um, we'd encourage you to go ahead and and uh, and, uh, and bail out now, and you can watch the recording later. Um, we uh, um, don't anticipate any problems. I will say that in the last couple of days, we've had some strange WebEx issues in general, and if we do have them, we hope that you'll bear with us, and we'll let you know that that's going on. We really appreciate everybody joining us, and uh, particularly Rob Lauren. Um, uh, for doing the WebEx, because there are so many people online, everyone except the speakers are muted. And, um, and so if you want to uh, chat, you can uh, do so in really one of two ways. If you have a question, um, we actually, it's, it's almost easier to use the chat window rather than the, rather than the little question and answer function within WebEx. But you can raise your hand virtually. You'll notice below the attendee list there is a little uh, icon of a hand and you can click that and if you raise your hand we'll see that as we scroll through the list and if mo multiple people click their hand at once it keeps track of who raised it first um, so it's pretty fair or and or you can just type a question in the chat window and we'd ask that you send it that you type the message to host presenter and panelist as your choice for the send to because that will make it uh, uh, easier for everybody to see your question and, uh, and, and a little more direct. I'm going to go ahead and uh, you, can, you can choose to make your slides full screen. If you do that, it will actually um, move the, uh, the uh, hide the participant and the chat window for raising your hand or asking questions. But you can usually move your mouse to the, to the top of the screen and you can actually see that you can get to um, the, uh, the, the, the chat window if you'd like. It's, it's totally up to you. Um, I did have folks that are asking how to access the the um, the uh, the audio, and so we'll, we'll go and, and connect with them directly uh, as we as we get started. So if you can see this and you can't hear me, we'll fix that in a little bit. Um, also, as we move along, I'd like to introduce the presenters. Before I introduce the presenters, who have a lovely picture here on the screen for us. Um, I will say that the Richmond Ambulance Authority was actually our, uh, our first commercial customer in uh, September of 2002. Uh, and we started, as many of you may know, in the biosurveillance and syndromic surveillance uh, sort of world. But uh, we were a custom system in Kansas City, Missouri, and then Richmond was the first system to have the first commercial version of something called First Watch. So they've been with us a long time, although they've implemented the uh, first pass uh, aspect um, fairly recently and, have, and are just frankly kicking butt. Um, so uh, on with us is Rob Lawrence, the Chief Operating Officer uh, of Richmond Ambulance Authority and Tom Luden, the QA, QI Operations Director. Um, Rob is a foreigner and I will tell you, you'll notice that he talks funny and, uh, and uh, he, will, he will be first to say that the, he speaks real English and we speak American. Um, but uh, but despite that, he's a he's a he's a good fellow. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. Um, and uh, and they've really done a nice job, I think, of implementing the balance of technology uh, and uh, and a complete system. And we're 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 really quite proud of what they've done. Rob, I will uh, uh, hand it over to you. And um, is he ready for me to give him control? Great. So I'll give you control, Rob, so you can change the slides. But if you need us to do anything at all, please just let me know. OK, my first question is, can you hear me back in San Diego? Yes, sir. I can hear him. Feedback? Yes. Indeed. OK, so change of slides, change of command, and change of accent. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Rob Lawrence. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at the Richmond Ambulance Authority. And uh, some say I have the original Virginia accent, so uh, we can debate that later. What we're going to talk about today is to really build the picture of how we leverage technology uh, in order to really produce world-class EMS, in order to ensure that we have a quality clinical product, uh, and to ensure that we are conducting 
between checks and balances all the way. So I'm going to start by painting the RAA picture, talk a bit about data, which as some people will know is our favorite four letter word, and then go on to talk about the quality piece of that, and then talk about the, the, the whole patient episode, uh, and then perhaps a little bit of crystal ball gazing into what's around the corner and how technology is absolutely essential in helping us as an industry take the next step forward. Um, Todd beat me to the disclaimer at the bottom. We are uh, the oldest su surviving customer, I guess, uh, for uh, First Watch, First Pass, and we've been together for 12 years. Um, Co-presenting with me is uh, Tom Luden, and if you've read the GEMS article, uh, which is on the right-hand side of that slide there, Tom is uh, normally uh, uh, encrusted in uh, screens and data, uh, and uh, that was an article that myself and Michael Gerber, who I know is listening today, so hi, Mike, uh, wrote for the magazine to talk about our total quality management approach to operations. And so let's sort of start building the story. First of all, RAA is a very busy EMS environment and we are just approaching now 60,000 calls for service a year. And so that presents us with a number of challenges, as I will describe, but not least the fact that if I had to have a set of eyes on every single call sheet that we produce, I would be employing a cast of thousands in order to do that. And so that's really one of the reasons that we're going to be leveraging, well, we are leveraging technology in going forward. Um, and so that really is, is a key thing. Um, we were, as I said, the first customer of First Watch. We're also a 23-year-old former public utility model, now a self-operated public utility model that was created by Todd's dad, Jack Stout. And so we're thankful to the, the whole Stout family, I have to say. What do we have in Richmond? Well, we have some interesting, uh, some interesting stats. And uh, so what's crime got to do with anything? Why am I starting with that? Because there's only one certain outcome of any uh, crime, and that is quite simply a patient or a victim and or a patient. And so we have uh, some, some issues here that keep us fairly busy in the city of Richmond. Uh, I have to say as a disclaimer, this is not uh, written by the uh, Richmond Chamber of Commerce, but actually things are improving in our city and we're very proud of the fact that crime stats are, are coming down. Nevertheless, it's a patient generator for us and it keeps us very busy. Sadly, also, we, somebody asked me in the UK how I would describe and, and, and classify my city. It's a classic American city with its classic American inner city issues of, of poverty, of uh, socioeconomic issues. And the Mayor's Youth Academy very use, youthfully, usefully did some stats for us uh, a way back when. And you can see that we have some interesting uh, poverty stats here, some interesting uh, demographics. And what that means is that for those people in our city, EMS, whether it's uh, first response from our, our fire department or whether it's our first response and a transport from the Richmond Ambulance Authority, we very much are the last health and social care safety net. And so that plays a part in the absolute volume we see in our city. We also, because of that, have a very strong public health relationship. And I do a lot of talks around the place and I would ask if this was a, an audience filled room for folk to raise their hands if they knew the name or were, were acquainted with their local public health director. And uh, it's quite surprising the amount of EMS organizations that have no idea, no notion of who their public health director is and shame on them because whilst we are public safety, we are also very much in the house of public health as well. And uh, if we can prevent something rather than curing it, that's always uh, a good idea. However, in the meantime, we'll accept the, the data and information that's coming in to help us identify a, a cause or a cure going forward. We're also a major stop on the EMS World Tour, and we, we attract a lot of visitors. I actually came to Richmond 10, nine years ago on a tour and was kidnapped and stayed here. Um, but we have a lot of folk come through to, to see how high performance uh, works at, at, at its essence, uh, and we're very proud of that fact. We also like to do a lot of learning here, and there is never a day where we don't learn a thing. And we like to pay, we like to pay that forward in terms of writing, in terms of broadcasting, in terms of producing academic papers, in terms of research, uh, because we believe that uh, anything that we learn, we would like to share with the industry to make it that much better as we go forward. Uh, research in the EMS pre-hospital arena is somewhat lacking, sadly. Obviously, that's something we need to work on and something we need to do. That, of course, takes committed people to do that, but it also takes data and information and a will to do it. And so we are very much, uh, have very much signed on for that as well. 
The other thing, and this kind of starts to get into the, the, the meat of the presentation almost, is that our city is not a very rich one. Our payer mix would be the only thing, if you're dealing with billing and you look at our payer mix, you will see that we are not uh, getting a lot of money per se back from the bills that we're writing. We have, quite honestly, the open secret about RAA is we have no choice but to be efficient based on the payer mix, the folk that are out there, the inability, sometimes the inability to pay uh, that we have. And so we adopt the notion here, which quite simply, and I'll credit my boss, Chip Decker, about we have the philosophy of the bucket of money. And whilst we don't have, and we're, we have about a 23% city subsidy, the rest comes from the payer mix. Uh, our bucket of money philosophy is that uh, if we can maintain the bucket of money, we can afford to do things like pay people. Uh, we can afford the nice vehicles, the nice equipment, and once in a while, maybe even the pay raise. If we start to uh, make poor decisions, poor business decisions, and EMS is a business, like it or not, if we start to make poor business decisions, our bucket of money will soon hemorrhage, and then we will run into financial difficulties. That's all, that philosophy is all the more important in this day and age because the public sector purse is shrinking. People are being challenged to do more with less. And a lot of the visitors that come to see us come to talk about how to run and maintain and attain efficient, an efficient and lean organization. And so it's all about, dare I say, in some cases, the money. For us, though, you know, our utilization is our currency. It's a combination of the available uh, cash flow, which is, of course, generated currently under a Part B payment, in other words, a transport for hospital, against the amount of available man hours that you have to do uh, to, to run the business. And so, therefore, we watch our, un our utilization because it is a form of currency very closely, because if we put too many people on, then actually we, we have a higher uh, uh, pay packet, if you like. Uh, if we have not enough people on, we fail to perform. And so we have to strike that balance every single day based on the amount of available cash from our, as I say, from our bucket of money. And so we need information. We need information and data and lots of it in order to help us run our, our business. And as I say, EMS is a business. One of the first things that we do, and uh, when people come to see us, we talk about the fact that some organizations perceive they have little to no information. And uh, that, I think, is an interesting discussion point because EMS organizations have more information than sometimes they know what to do with. And one of the things we will certainly look at is what the population is up to. Humans are creatures of habit. We all wake up at six o'clock in the morning. Circadian rhythm suggests we have our cardiac arrests, we drive to work, we crash our vehicles. In the middle of the day, if you're running non-emergency patient transport, as well as the emergency side, then uh, hospitals will discharge because they're also creatures of habit and you have a peak of day, which is created by hospital discharges. We then go into the evening where we may go outside, have a beverage, alcohol versus gravity takes over, and before you know it, you have an EMS call. And so by understanding the volume and the rhythm, that can help you almost prepare your day, prepare your response, and ensure that you have the right amount of people on duty at the right time. And so that's a, a, an efficiency measure, and it's also uh, about absolutely managing time. System status management, management as Jerry Overton once called it. We're not a station-based system here. We use data and information to understand where the mathematical probability of the next patient is going to come from is. And so by applying all of our data systems to, uh, in terms of time and in terms of location from years and years worth of information, we're able to then use technology, and in this case it's another product, to help us plot where the next call is going to come from. Uh, as I say, it's a mathematical probability model, enables us to work out where we need to be posted, where we need to be located, and like it or not, that uh, the uh, SSM model works for us for two reasons. One, of course, it's not our emergency, it's the patient's emergency, so why wouldn't we be as close to the patient as we possibly can for the next call? Two means we're not driving as far or as fast on emergency uh, road conditions. And so therefore that becomes back into one of our other uh, programs and philosophies, which is the culture of safety. And so we manage time and space very closely because they're linked uh, and that data that goes with it is linked to the finance and linked to actually the delivery of, of EMS. And uh, within our own organizational mission, our task is to convert the amount of available dollars into high quality or world-class EMS. And so, therefore, there is a need for data at every uh, opportunity. So we are using uh, 
technology, we're using systems. Um, we use uh, First Watch by uh, uh, or the First Watch system uh, to do many things. Demand analysis to enable us to look at where that demand is, uh, what time it's coming in at, uh, and by simply conducting a exercise where we're combining the amount of demand, the amount of hours for which we are needed against the schedule or schedule, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're listening on. Uh, we're able to then to start to work out how many people we need on duty, when we need them on duty, and if we're going to run into any uh, operational situations that we may need to make a command decision. And so that gives us an amazing situation, situational awareness. What you're looking at here is a uh, program that uh, actually Tom, who will come on in a second, wrote, and it's our FLOT, our forward-looking operational technology. And what it's doing is it's looking at the center line, if you want to look at that, represents right now. Uh, and anything to the left of that, the, 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 the thick blue, is the amount of available um, staff we have on duty. It's not a single line because we have a consumption of time. People are coming and going all the time, so it's not a single line. The yellow line, or the yellow uh, blob, if you like, is the actual demand that we're seeing. And so if we, can, if we ensure that we have the right amount of people on duty, at the right time, uh, and we allow for both time and space, then theoretically we have enough people here to deal with the patient's need when they need us, but not to overload the, uh, the, the manpower and the manning in the organization. Um, the, the red bars on the bottom are exceptions where we are uh, beyond our response time. Anything forward of the center line looking forward represents the green where we know we have non-emergency patient transport journeys already booked. And that enab enables us to streamline to demand smooth and something we're working on with our hospitals right now, again, using the data and information that we already have is to understand that everybody wants their patient out at three o'clock precisely, for example. Well, if we are able to plot that going forward, we can then almost have a flight booking type system where we know where we have slots, where we know where we have vehicles available, um, and therefore nobody or people are less likely to be disappointed because you're going to be late for them. And so we're able to sort of plan that out. Also looking forward to the very sort of three, at the three quarters way through, you see a little red peak on, on the top there. That's where we have demand exceeds our current manning. So it's, that's a decision point where we have to take a command decision. Well, actually, demand says we need more people than we've actually got scheduled on. So what? Well, do we put up an admin, admin truck? Do we need to put out for overtime? And so by combining the demand analysis against the schedule, and you can actually you can overlap that in an Excel spreadsheet, you can learn a lot and you can make some pretty good business and command decisions based on that. So it's using every piece of data that you have in your uh, data mine, your data armory, your data bank, to actually help make some good decisions. We're also using, uh, as Todd said right at the start, we came into this by having a biosurveillance system. We still use that today. Um, what does it do for us? Well. Imagine if you had one call center, one call taker, one telephone, one map, and that person was on 24 hours a day, then you'd have an idea, because there's a one person, one set of ears, what's going on in your locality. Of course, as a, uh, pub, as a uh, PSAP ourselves, we don't have one person on duty. We have a multitude of people over the course of the day, and you can't keep track of syndromic activity, um, geo-clustering, clustering of calls, uh, and the so therefore, we're using the system to actually tell us when we're seeing this sort of thing. And it's been very useful for us. We were able to identify uh, a flu uh, outbreak a few years ago, about 12 hours before the declaration was made, because we were quite simply seeing that influx of flu-like symptoms. And so we've configured our systems to help us identify when something is breaking out, uh, mumps being another one. We're also using uh, every type of dashboard to help us um, to see where we are, and these are looking pretty much at the response time side of, side of things. But again, it helps us maintain focus and ensure that we are, again, doing everything we can for our patient. It's not our emergency. Um, big debate around response times. However, if you start to look at the triple aim, which I'll return to a little bit later on, there is a patient expectation that we're going to be quick. We're going to satisfy their needs. So I'm sure the response time debate will, will rage. But interestingly, the triple aim has kind of swung, to my mind anyway, the pendulum back a little bit because there's a requirement to actually satisfy the customer or the patient. 
We're able also to pick out some, some interesting data points. Uh, we work very closely with our local um, narcotics team here uh, in the city. Uh, we were seeing that we were having spikes of overdose, which is the top, uh, the top slide, or the top part of the slide, shall I say. And we were starting to see some interesting things. We were seeing spikes in activity of overdose, but we were also seeing lulls in activity as well. And when we started to talk to our local narcotics guys, they, would they, were, they were able to tell us when the big drug bust occurred, uh, when the new uh, substance arrived on the street. And so we were able to do some interesting analysis around those, uh, those, those call types and actually combine with some other public safety partners in order to, to help things out. Interestingly, uh, we had last year uh, a respiratory uh, outbreak, and in that particular month on the right-hand side of the graph there, we administered more uh, drugs to children under the age of 12 who are having respiratory issues than we've ever done before. Um, of course, our data, our first watch data, the e emails that we get alerting us to the system, we also share with our public health districts. So as soon as I see something, they see something too, uh, and that enables them to work out uh, uh, if they need to investigate or indeed if they want to come back and cross-reference with us uh, how uh, if they have any questions. And so again, this amount of information enables us to do what we do and makes our day a little bit easier because we've managed to order that information into, quite simply, an intelligence product. We also, as I said, we've set up uh, alerts and alarms, I'm calling them bells and whistles, to tell us everything that we want to know. And of course, whether it's a, a heroin overdose in the city, whether we've cracked a patient, of course, that immediately goes into a QAQI process. Uh, if we're conducting chest strains, et cetera, we want to know that straight away. And we want to get into that level of um, analysis of the call to make sure that our providers provide us quite simply the best care. And so we have those set up as well to help us along. So, so far, I've spent 10 or 15 minutes now talking about what quite simply is one fifth of the job. We've talked about the demand analysis. We've talked about using that information and data in order to be poised to respond to the patient at the next call. But if you take an average 60 minute job cycle, uh, we've only talked about one fifth of the process so far. Uh, we've talked, we're, we're in position, we're poised. What about the other bit? Well, of course, the good thing is with all this information, I can tell you exactly down to the second what our fractile response time. If you must ask for an average, I can probably give you an average, but we're a fractile-led organization. And we have all sorts of response level data. Now, coming back to the uh, triple aim, of course, that may well be a, a very important thing to know. But what about the other uh, four-fifths of the response? And we want to start measuring and looking at that as well. And of course, the clinical output is our bread and butter. It is the thing with which we are going to do the best for most. And so with, with the advent of electronic patient care records, uh, with the advent of our ability to interrogate those electronic patient care records means that we're able now to understand exactly what's going on. Uh, in the days when we only relied on the medical priority dispatch system, sometimes the presenting condition that the patient gave us down the phone wasn't quite exactly what the patient was suffering from. And so we had to do a little bit of filtering to work out whether the patient that was reported as having a fall was in fact having a cardiac arrest, uh, or whether the patient that had some sort of uh, chest pain was in fact uh, having uh, some uh, effect from a, uh, a sorry, from a uh, overdose, for example. And so we start to get into quality control. And of course, Every organization has its clinical protocols. If the organization doesn't, its local uh, governmental um, entity probably has a set of protocols with which to clinically follow. Uh, and of course, as a call center, we're also conducting quality control and a depth of analysis uh, as an accredited center of excellence as well. So we all, always had uh, an ability, a set of instructions, in other words, the protocols with which we would do business. And we'd always had some degree of quality control with which, whether it was from call taking or whether it, whether it was actually setting up certain audits of our 60 odd thousand uh, electronic patient care records in order to try and filter and look and understand how well we were doing. It was nowhere near as good as the, well, we were actually, we were actually five minutes, 30 seconds average response time today. And so we wanted to get around that and actually take steps to introduce uh, what we've now come to adopt, which is a total quality management approach to our operation. And again, using uh, technology to leverage at every stage. 
Total quality management, as you can see from the slide, requires leadership. We've got that. Requires the involvement of people. Well, there are a number of people involved in our total quality management process, as I will describe in a second. Uh, you need a process-driven approach. We certainly do that. Um, a system approach to management. Um, continuous improvement. And uh, all of this is a big loop, as you will see in a second. Uh, and the ability and desire to make factual evidence-based decisions. We've banned anecdote here, banned it years ago, because actually we have enough information with which to make sound and good decisions. Um, and mutually beneficial uh, supplier relationships and customer focus. There is a customer at every stage of our operation. The medic is producing an electronic patient care record. Eventually, that's going to the biller for conversion into, into currency. Um, the call center is sending a call for dispatch to the ambulance crew. So there's a customer at every stage. And therefore, by thinking about the internal marketplace, if you want to call it that, we become very customer focused to ensure that what we give the next person in the link in the chain is a quality piece of information or quality guidance. And so we created a total quality management committee and a process. And it's a circle. As I said, it's a circle of life. It starts with a call. It goes through call taking. It goes through response, treatment, transport, the creation and auditing of records, billing, and ultimately training because we need to have uh, we need to have uh, ensure that we're able to test and adjust as we go. And so we now have a regular total quality management committee. Uh, it involves many many people from within this organisation. And uh, so from the call, the call comes in. We have a QA, QI process within the call taking. That's how we maintain our accredited center of excellence. Uh, we have our response time standards and the measurement that goes with that. Uh, we have our treatment and on-scene compliance with our protocols uh, from a daily perspective, we have an after action review, or as we call it, our operational coordination conference to look at how we've performed uh, operationally over the day. Um, we have the ability to amend and change and, and look at the records from a QAQI process. Uh, our billing department also has its own QAQI process. And then we have a training department that sits at the end of it. In a lot of organizations, all of these particular functions sit in silos. And uh, once in a while, they may stick their head out of, the, out of their respective silo, and they may communicate with each other. We bring all of this together under uh, with Tom, as you'll hear shortly. And also, we have a total quality management manager, TQM manager, that bring all of this process together. Uh, and everybody meets to actually both conduct test audits across the entire spectrum of the organization to ensure that we are uh, delivering the best uh, product we possibly can and to ensure that everything is linked up and connected and to ensure everything is measured and managed. And so that process uh, helps us a great deal. So what I'm going to do now is uh, to talk about the process. I'm going to hand over to Tom. And Tom's now going to talk about uh, we've moved from the, uh, the, I guess, the reactive measurement to now uh, to the retrospective measurement, sorry, to the re real-time measurement. And just to sort of conclude before I hand over, as I said before, we could tell you exactly how fast we're driving, tell you how quickly it was until we got there. But now the exciting thing is we're able to now to look at our clinical output and to measure exactly how we're doing live. And uh, over to you, Tom. Thank you. This is Tom Luden. I also have a Virginia accent, but one that you perhaps recognize more easily. I'll give Rob a quick breather here. What we're looking at here is uh, what you could call bundles, so to speak. And this is uh, essentially a protocol that not all PCRs will be examined with uh, thoroughly, but each PCR will be examined with to some degree. This is, as you see at the top, the cardiac arrhythmia one. Um, so let's go look at every PCR that gets submitted into our system. If it determines it to be a cardiac arrhythmia, it will apply these tests to it. If it was not a cardiac arrhythmia, it won't. Uh, so for example, if the medic put on their call sheet that the patient had a third degree AV block, it's going to look at this and make sure that two sets of vitals were recorded, uh, pain score, patient allergy, et cetera, et cetera. However, if this was a routine dialysis trip uh, and no cardiac rhythm was monitored and the pulse was within normal limits, uh, this test won't even be applied to it. Um, and if you're picturing this in your head, you can already see how much time this would take to do this manually without the use of technology. Um, just, uh, just for fun, I 
did a quick measurement of how many calls I could completely review by hand per day. And I came up with about 50 that I could reliably look at uh, 100%, make sure the signatures were right, make sure all the vitals were documented, narrative was quality, all those types of things. And I could knock out about 50 in a normal office day. So to handle our call volume, you would need at least four people who would probably last a week or two before they quit, it being such a thankless job to look each call sheet like that all day long. Uh, so you would definitely be relying on technology to pull something like this off. Um, now here's another bundle here. We see this is the trauma one. Uh, the, the first ones are very similar to the one before that. You always want two sets of vitals. Uh, you always want a pain score recorded, provided that the patient was conscious. If you look over to the right of the patient score one, you'll see we actually only hit that 75% of the time of our trauma patients. Um, but we can make a deduction that for this brief period, uh, May the 1st through May the 8th of this year, there were four calls uh, which were included for trauma, it being a trauma call and the patient was transported using lights and sirens. Uh, one of those calls, the patient had altered mental status, thus we didn't require it be recorded. Um, more than one protocol may be evaluated per PCR. Uh, for example, if a patient was suffering a heart attack and rolled over their vehicle, both the STEMI protocol would be applied and also the trauma and arrhythmia protocols would be applied. But our stroke protocol or our plasma protocol, they would not be. If nothing on the PCR says anything about a stroke, the stroke test won't be evaluated. Over here we have some final scoring for each protocol. Up top, uh, for that time period that was measured, we had 19 cardiac arrest ones. Only two of them passed though. Uh, which is, uh, if you just look at it from a technology standpoint, you'd say that's terrible. We only had uh, two calls out of 19 pass. But if you look at the adjusted pass count, there were actually 16 that passed. Because of those, uh, those 17 that did not initially pass, I went and back and reviewed each of those. Uh, it does require human interaction with this. And to give a brief example, um, say one of our tests was that the autopulse was used. We wanted to go into the review queue if the autopulse was not used no matter what. Well, if I look at it and see that the patient exceeded the weight limits of the autopulse, then that's not the medic's fault that the autopulse wasn't used. So then I would go back and say that the care was within guidelines in that case. I'm not going to ding the medic for it. And if you look at the last column over, the adjusted protocol compliance, that's the, uh, the real score after the human has come in and reviewed here. So if you see those are significantly better than the, uh, the raw pass count. Um, for this measure date range for the slide right here, we weren't using the universal protocol, thus the 0% in that case. And over here, some final reporting. I printed out, and this gives a medic by medic review. I blanked out their last names for their privacy, but we can see here not every protocol was applied for every medic. Uh, in this case, there is two STEMIs, one RICE, and looks like one trauma versus pretty much everyone has at least one cardiac arrhythmia and everyone has some universal. And we'll see that some people were in the red for the initial test review. Uh, Evan here had two STEMIs that got reviewed and only one of them passed. But if you look all the way over the adjusted protocol, um, he ended up with 100%. It may be he didn't get aspirin to one of the patients. And we know that you know these days we think aspirin's very important. We want it on board as soon as possible. Of course, we'd want that measured as one of our tests, but. If I go back in here as the QAQI person and see, oh, your patient had a GCS of six, I'd prefer that you don't put aspirin in their mouth, and in fact, you didn't. You did what I want you to do, excellent. Then I'll mark that as okay, and you end up with 100% at the end of the day. Now, if this was a perfectly conscious patient that was having an ST elevation MI and didn't have any allergies and had not taken aspirin before we got there, anything like that, and you didn't give aspirin, then I'm gonna type an email to you suggesting that in the future you do give aspirin for those cases. But it really does take a human to look at, was this okay or was this not okay? You can't be 100% relying on technology, but where this saves you a lot of time is if you hit each and every single one of those benchmarks for the protocol, it doesn't bring it into my review queue. So here's their score after the initial, after the final review here, and this would be what would go toward their evaluations. Moving down the columns, we have which protocols they were evaluated for. Not every protocol applies for every PCR. We have the number of incidents total they were reviewed for. Um, this does weigh into their evaluations. If you were a part-timer and maybe you only had, you know, two or three calls per month that actually failed a first pass test and required review, that might significantly skew the percentage. We might play less weight to it versus over a 12-month period, if you had a few hundred in here, we would consider that a pretty reliable score. 
um, how many pass the software test and the way we use the technology here is we don't actually review that any further. If you fell into our stroke protocol and you had every single one of those tests perfect technology wise, you checked a glucose, the stroke scale was done, um, pupil measurements, everything, I don't review that any further in, in terms of this. We really only look at it if one of those things was not done. And then finally, the post review score. This is the important one. And that's how this plays into the full circle. This is really at the, the four o'clock position on this circle here. Uh, the treatment, the on-scene assessment, and importantly, the EPCR. Uh, when we first start, when we first fired up first pass, one of the things we used it for was evaluating some deficiencies in our PCR configuration. Uh, for example, the stroke protocol, we had four or five different stroke assessments that were available to the medics, whichever one they preferred. And you know, after a few weeks of looking at how many failures there were in first pass, we decided let's pick a stroke assessment, let's see what's best about it, um, maybe combine two or three of them and just put them in one place, tell the medics, hey, please use this stroke assessment. Um, save them some time and having to decide which one to use because we had the MEND exam, we had Cincinnati, we had several of them. And that's really what first pass was good for for EPCR configuration. We found continuous problems there if we see the problem occur enough and we want the medics to do it the same way each time, that was an opportunity to change the configuration and those problems went away within a week or so. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Rob. So just to recap, uh, Tom was talking about uh, our application of the first pass system. Uh, of course, we are now retaking and, and drawing out uh, key stats and data directly out of the electronic patient care record as soon as it's, it's uh, synced, sank, sunk, whatever the technical term is for that. And then that's giving us instant feedback. And of course, then we are comparing that against the bundles of care that we set up in conjunction with the folk at uh, First Watch, First Pass to really configure the, uh, the, the, the product, if you like, against our protocol. So we've built it to our protocol. In other words, we're measuring the, the, the medic against the protocol that we expect them to deliver. And so that's the beauty of the system, that we are actually testing our, our medic, uh, the process against our own protocol. And that really is a, is a key piece of, a key thing. And as Tom will tell you, that uh, when he provides feedback to folk, it's not him providing feedback, it's actually the protocol that's providing feedback to the medic. And so that's a useful thing. So looking at the crystal ball, what next? Well, we have leveraged as much information as we can, as much data as we can in order to go forward. And of course, what is next round the corner? Well, I've mentioned the triple aim a number of times and it is here to stay. Uh, we are required to do all of those things, provide best uh, best value for a public health system, to provide improved quality, safety and experience for the patient and patient experiences. Hospitals are now, uh, well some would say having their, patient, their, their payments adjusted based on the patient experience. Uh, some would say it's not far around the corner before EMS systems and ambulance services have the same uh, levy applied with them. And obviously to provide improved health and equity for all populations. And so if you're not familiar with the uh, triple aim, uh, perhaps there's a time to go and revise and refresh that. The other thing that's around the corner is this, ICD-10. And as you can see, we took the ICD-10 uh, handbook and took it round to the logis logistic department and weighed it. And you can see it's a very weighty tone indeed. Um, ICD-9, 13,000 diagnostic codes are now turning into 68,000 diagnostic codes with ICD-10. What's it got to do with us? Well, of course, we now have to do actually go back to basics in fact and the medic has to uh, remember all of those charting exercises and lessons that uh, he or she learned when they were going through their basic EMT or medic training and apply them. We are required to be exceptionally specific. Specificity is one of the catchwords uh, for this. And so we're going to use uh, our technology and our systems uh, going forward to enable us to ensure that we are capturing that specificity, to ensure that we are configuring our electronic patient care records to ensure to, to, cap, 
to get uh, those key pieces of information that we need going forward. Does this affect us? Yes, indeed it does. And we are, again, October the 1st, ICD-10 cuts in. Uh, we have uh, created work groups. We've created training plans for both our medics and also the folk that are involved with our billing departments. If you have a billing department, there are courses galore to go on, but people need to get on them. And come the 1st of October, we're into ICD-10. Um, so we need to be creating uh, an effective uh, and correct call sheet for the billing. Uh, because what we have heard is that 50% uh, that, that of those could well be bounced because they're not complete enough. What does that mean if you're in the private sector or if you're in an organization that, re that relies on that cash flow? Well, if you have 50% of your bills bounced, that puts you into a cash flow disaster potentially. And so one of the things we, we're looking to leverage any piece of technology going forward is to actually address this particular issue now, because that's the, the next uh, big ticket item that's not far away indeed. Uh, we're counting down to the UCI World Ch Bike Race World Championships here, which is about 76 days today. Uh, but we're also counting down to the beginning of ICD-10, because it is going to be a game changer, ready or not. And so those are some of the things that we're going to be lever leveraging technology and using all of the systems that we have, and particularly the ones that we've talked about today going forward. And so final thoughts. Well, as I said already, the EMS is a business like it or not. Um, public sector purse, the, the public sector purse is shrinking, and we need to be prepared to deliver the service as efficiently and as effectively as possible. We have data. Data is our favorite four-letter word. And by taking that data, applying the Mark 1 eyeball to it, you create an intelligence product. That intelligence product enables you to act, react, and, uh, and, and ultimately be successful. And so the systems that we've taken on board, the total quality management process that we've adopted means that we actually now formally leave no stone unturned and are able to produce a quality product. Uh, and with that, Todd, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thanks, guys, very much. Uh, that's an uh, incredible presentation. We had a, a, a few questions as, uh, the, as the session moved along, but we have plenty of time for more questions now. If you'd like to type them into your chat window, um, if you have a little phone or headset by your name on WebEx, I could actually unmute you and allow you to ask the question yourself if it's a complex one. Um, so if you check your name in the participant window and if you have a phone or a headset next to it, you can just raise your hand with the hand icon and, and I'll unmute you. And for those who can't see the chat window, if you just happen to be uh, connected in by phone, uh, a recording of the webinar will be emailed out to all attendees or, or a link to the recording, so that should work. Uh, Wesley Pardo uh, asks, um, how FirstPass changed your QA, QI process? I'll pick up for a second and I'll let Tom jump back in, but but it, it has sped up the process because we are able to live, uh, in, in, in one sense, live see how we're doing. Uh, what Tom does when he comes in in the morning is to look at where we have uh, had those exceptions to the rules, in other words, where you, you, you failed a bundle test, if you want to call it that, and is able then to, to conduct that immediate analysis and provide feedback to the provider within the same shift almost, and that's certainly in a high volume organization is probably an unheard of event. Tom? Now I have a personal rule. I've broken this once or twice, but I do try to have within one business day feedback to the crews about the calls, which uh, I've had a few of them come to me and ask how the system does that automatic. And I said, well, it's not quite automatic. I do need to do it. Um, but I will say the technology allows me to do a whole bunch of other stuff with my day since my whole day is not taken up going through first pass and still get them feedback within one business day. Um, to give you a brief outline without specifically showing you on the screen, I'll come in, I'll load up the first pass web page, it will have a list of calls for me to review. I'll open them up, see what first pass took issue with, open the call sheet, see whether I agree with first pass or I agree with the medic, so to speak. Uh, you could picture a trial judge. Which side am I agreeing with on this one? If I agree with first pass that they did wrong, I'll type up a quick email to them saying, hey, do this differently in the future. Or was it so egregious that I can't let this PCR sit in my archives in this manner? Um, I'll let them know I'm sending them the call sheet again to try again. Uh, go and make a fix for me, resubmit it, and uh, that'll be the end of it. For all market is, uh, they did the way I like them to do it. Um, you know, a quick example was the aspirin one. If the patient's unconscious, I don't want them giving oral medications. I'll just mark that as first pass, say this is okay, and we'll move along. 
Um, but that's how it's changed it. The way we used to do it, we would pick a random sampling of calls, uh, but we would get really far behind with it. Uh, weeks would get by, and it's not fresh in the medic's mind. Uh, I've run a few thousand calls in the city, and I know that if we're running 12 or more calls a day and you're telling me about a call that happened last month, um, it's not going to be fresh in my mind, and uh, the feedback's not going to be as quality. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and then I'll handle the next one. Can you create a system compliance percentage report similar to the report you showed for individual providers? And yes, there is one. You can look at it by individual. You can look at it by system compliance. You can look at it by protocol, so cardiac arrhythmia, uh, STEMI, stroke. Or you can look at it by test, so there are things that you do, uh, such as give oxygen or start an IV that, uh, that are in multiple protocols. And so you can see how we do for giving oxygen during cardiac arrhythmias rather than, um, uh, you know, a stroke and, and, and also across the whole platform. Um, another one is, um, uh, we actually have, have a lot of questions, so this would be great to go through. Let me scroll back up. Um, who built the first watch charts? Um, the um, the uh, um, charts that Tom showed towards the end are, are part of first watch. The uh, um, awesome chart that um, that was described with the with the, the, the vertical center being now and and uh, and the um, uh, history and to the to the left and the future being to the right. Uh, is, uh, is, a, is a Tom Luden Richmond chart that I, I hope he will let us start to use within First Watch in general. Um, what did your QA QI process consist of prior to implementation of First Pass? And that question came in earlier, so it may it, 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 it may have been answered already. It's. The concept was similar. The process was different. Um, us being an ACE agency for the 911 call center, we have a, a very rigid standard for the auditing that we do in there. Uh, for those that aren't in that system, it's a certain percentage of calls that must be reviewed, and we also go ahead and review all cardiac arrest and all choking calls just for the high acuity of those calls. Um, and then the concept was we would review the PCRs for those calls. Um, but doing that full review of every single call sheet that goes in there, we would often get quite behind. So, I mean, that's what it was before. It was just the, the time saving is where the big difference is here now. And if you're only looking at 7% of your calls, 5% of your calls, 8% of your calls, whatever it may be, that's another 90 plus percentage that's not being reviewed at all, that we're really just uh, taking it on faith that they were done correctly. And it, it should be evident how much better it is to have 100% of your calls reviewed. <laughs> Great. So, um, and then uh, an another quick question: Can you uh, confirm that Richmond is using the Zoll PCR, and if so, what what version? I was typing the answer into that now, but since it's been asked, I'll answer now. We are, to the best of my knowledge, using Tablet 5.4 uh, through Zoll's Rescue Net. Moving to six at some point this year, we haven't yet. Um, but Virginia is doing the Nemesis 3 implementation this year, and we need to be on board with that by the end of the calendar year. So at some point in the next few months, we'll be moving over to Tablet 6.0. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, just a, just a quick one I'll handle is um, can, can it work with multiple kinds of or different kinds of electronic patient care record uh, systems? And yes, as long as the data is is robust enough and available, we we can and do. We work with most of the the, the names of the EPCR vendors that you'll know. Uh, and uh, uh, really, unless the data is just not available, we'll we we will figure out a way to make it work um, as we go through it. Um, uh, John from uh, Fire and EMS asks, could you talk about the procurement of this technology, cost, training, and other requirements? How, how Sorry, are we talking about the, uh, the, the, the how much we paid you, Todd, or uh, something else? Oh, I, I think I think I think he's really talking through a sort of you know, uh, or at least what I would guess is w how hard was it to get in terms of uh, um, you know to push through. I know Richmond is definitely a, a return on investment type system, so maybe sort of uh, take that angle of of uh, you know w what did you hope to get out of it? Did it did it make sense for you? Is it paid off? Things like that. Yeah, indeed, and, and, and thank you for, for clarifying that. Yeah, I mean, we certainly much we we very much uh, look at the ROI perspective, and it's a case of, and I think Tom alluded to this earlier on. Do we have a cast of a thousand checkers, 
or do we actually, you know, are, are we able to employ the, the, the humans out, out on the street where they need to be and then use technology and leverage that technology to be a part of our system? So if you start to look at what is the annual set I need, you know, you may need four or five people depending on the volume of calls that you're doing to achieve the same level of output. You then uh, add that salary back into what you're going to pay for a, a technology system. And then perhaps it becomes a no-brainer that you can actually, you know, as I say, leverage technology um, in face of the Mark One human being, because the, 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 and, and it becomes more consistent as well. And so that very much was one of our sort of underlying decision points that uh, we we needed to have something to assist us in what we do. Now, of course, that then was the catalyst to, uh, at the same time we brought in our total quality management system, we actually re regraded one of our managers into the TQM uh, manager, who's now working alongside Tom uh, to uh, help us to, you know, to, to transition everybody through to ICD-10 to ensure that feedback is consistent. Um, and if I may, Todd, I'll pick up on another question that came in, was for Tom, but uh, feedback to each crew, what happens if there's to be a call that requires discipline disciplinary action. Well, the first thing is that uh, we have a self-report tech philosophy here, and that comes really stems all the way from our medical director, Dr. Joseph uh, Ornato. Um, and so we, do, we believe in education rather than the punitive punishment, uh, because uh, paramedics are a very expensive resource, first of all, but actually we would rather educate somebody uh, through uh, having them understand, you know, how we require them to improve or what their process improvement needs to be than to punish them because actually you don't learn anything. And what it means is that people are less inclined to come forward with issues as they come up. So. Um, Disciplinary action is very much reserved for something that is that that is absolutely catastrophic and perhaps deliberate, and so therefore we have much more of a coaching mentality here. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and unmute Chris Newsom, who's raised his hand or her hand. I'm sorry, Chris could be either way. Apologize for that. Hang on one moment, and my screen just froze, which is awesome. I, I was afraid of having a few web. Oh, there we go. We're back. That's good. So, Chris, you should be unmuted right now. Chris, are you there? Okay. I'll. Uh, Chris did type in a question, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and mute you again. I apologize. There may be a technical problem. Does, does First Pass have the ability to assess if your current documentation is compliant with ICD-10? I mean, and in, in general, I think the answer is is probably no. Although Rob, I think you've done more work on ICD-10 there to have a sense of whether it, it could be used to, to to determine the level of compliance. I think it could certainly help. Um, I think that's going to be highly dependent on how your reimbursement department, or if you uh, if you send out for your third party agency, what their strategy is. Are they heavily reliant on the free text field, such as the narrative, or are they highly reliant on data entry fields, drop-down lists, that type of thing? Um, really, any piece of technology, be it first pass, custom reporting that you do, SQL reports, they're very good at searching, indexing, uh, aggregating data fields, drop-downs, and pick lists, and that type of thing. I've yet to see anything that's uh, any good, and I'm, I'm pretty good at it myself, at analyzing a narrative other than two human eyes putting, their, uh, putting themselves on it and reading the narrative. So first pass is not going to be very good for evaluating that if your reimbursement department is relying on the narrative to be ICD-10 compliant. If you come up with a strategy where you have drop-down boxes and pick lists, um, and that's driving your strategy, then this could be. But I will be honest, Richmond, we're more relying on the narrative from a reimbursement standpoint, so this will probably be less helpful for that. Great, and then I'm going to unmute uh, Richard Caudill. Um, Richard, you hang on one moment. No, WebEx is, uh, let's see, let me control M. Sorry about that. No, I can't unmute you. So for some reason it's stopping me. So Richard, if you can type in your message, I'd appreciate it, and I apologize for the inconvenience. Uh, I'll ask another question while we do that. Um, are there any plans to extend clinical QI to comparisons between pre-hospital care and hospital diagnoses? I'm not sure about Richmond, but I know in uh, Sedgwick County in, in Wichita, Kansas, uh, where FirstWatch actually monitors the uh, hospital ED and, uh, and, and admit data, 
uh, for hospital patients of their two major hospital systems there. We do uh, connect the dots between those, and, uh, and a call could actually look perfect in first pass in the EPCR record, uh, but because to come into the first pass queue for review based entirely upon something looking different than we expected in the hospital based on the, the EMS data. So it's a great question. Um, how long just, did it take? Just to add to that sort of like. Yes, sir. Just, just to add to that, we don't have that capability right now. It would most certainly be an aspiration. Uh, we are getting feedback. For example, we are contributing to CARES. Uh, we're doing a lot of work around STEMIs, et cetera, with our hospitals. We're blessed in Virginia to have uh, hospital liaison who folk who are actually EM, uh, uh, medics. And so we're able to get some of the key information back. At, so therefore, a lot of our knowledge around the critical trauma, you know, life-threatening patients isn't just ending at the uh, ED door. So we're able to get that back, but we, it's not an automated process as yet. Great. Uh, one question, how long did it take for you to transition to first pass? I wasn't actually here. I was away on military leave the day that we got first pass. I was back shortly thereafter. And I'll be honest, I'm the type that when I get a flat pack of furniture from the department store, the first thing I do is throw away the instructions. Um, so I was more of a <laughs> let's figure this out than let's get in touch with first pass and have them train me at it. Uh, but I did pick it up within a few days. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward system. Um, the first thing it shows when you load it up is the calls that need to be reviewed. You click on them. It says what it didn't like about them in plain text. Um, and then you have a drop-down box next to that that says, uh, what was your determination about it? Now, I will say it was not perfectly to my liking when we first got it. Some of the phrases were a little different than what we use here. But as, we, as we've been hammering away at, you have to use the technology to work for you. You don't really work for the technology. So every other week we had a, a teleconference with the folks over at FirstPass. This is what we would like to change about it, change this word to this word, or when I click here I want it to do this because we really wanted to match our protocols and the way we do things. Uh, you know, we had a standard before we had first pass, and we wanted first pass to enforce that standard. We didn't really have this set up where, okay, first pass is coming with a standard, and we want to change the way we do things to make the system happy. So I would say the first few weeks of set up and training was really just taking notes and saying, this is what I would like to change about it, not how does it work. Yeah, Just to add on to that, I was I was here at the the, the, the beginning, and uh, as you remember, Todd, the the, the, the pre meetings again. This is set up to our protocol, and so we had a, a number of uh, meetings where we would uh, de determine and identify which protocols we, we were, and what pieces and parts were going into the bundle. And so a lot of that pre work, whilst it, it it may have taken a few months, actually the wait has been worth it. Obviously, Tom did the fine tuning at the end of it, but getting the basics in first. Then we're now at the point now where we're, we know we're seeing a live product, and it's to our satisfaction and liking. Yeah, that that sounds great, and I think uh, there's a there's a series of related questions that I'll answer that are things like that. Can it be tweaked? Uh, we we start with a standard bundle of protocols that are the typical ones that you would expect, um, and sort of standard sets of questions. But even within say two different Zoll systems or two different Sancio or ESO or Image Trend type systems. Um, the way the data is captured and stored will be different as well as the protocols being different. So each system is really uh, uh, an implementation specific to them and then sometimes it is as simple as asking the question in a way that is most familiar. We do all of that at the first watch, first pass side of the house um, and then also uh, for changing tests and protocols, we're really your interface, we'll work with you. A lot of times we'll have to look for something multiple ways. So did we give aspirin or not can be in a number of places within an EPCR record depending on the EPCR and the agency. And so that will be uh, um, you know, sort of a situation that, that uh, it has to be uh, done in a, in a pretty sophisticated way technologically in order to make it simple for the end user. Um, I'll see. And, and for folks that are having to get off the call, we'll, we'll keep the recording going until we're through. Uh, so if you want to come back and watch the end of it, for those of you, you're more than welcome. Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't know how long you have, Rob and Tom, but uh, um, we can keep answering questions here. Um, how many separate protocols are you using in your first pass system? No, Tom's just stepped out, and I'm assuming he's still listening in, so he may be able to answer that accurately for me. And if not, um, we can look that up. 
and let you know. Probably six or seven yep. would, would be my guess. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back in a second. He just had to run out for a second. Yep. Yeah, probably six or seven are pretty typical, uh, and uh, and uh, universal being one of them. Uh, some people will do billing. Other people will look very specifically at, um, um, you know, refusals and uh, transfers and transports differently than others. Uh, Richmond is using eight um, uh, protocols. Do you want to name them off, Deb, would you mind? Airway management, uh, cardiac arrest, cardiac arrhythmia, CVA stroke, device protocol, STEMI, trauma, and universal. Great. Thank you. Uh, and, yes, we do work with just, air Just to say, Todd, uh, our rice, the, the rice we refer to is, is our therapeutic hypothermia protocol. Great. Thank you. Um, and, yes, we do work with uh, intermedics data for, the, for uh, uh, Chris Del Campo who asked that. Uh, what was the training component like for the program? Does the company provide in-house opportunities? Um, so most of our training is done by WebEx, um, and, uh, and it's really very specific to the users that, that need it. And so it's not like you're watching a video and being left alone. Uh, the biweekly and sometimes weekly calls that uh, Tom and Rob mentioned um, really are often with the people that are using the, the system, and so they learn. Uh, but we really will train you as well and as much as you need to. Um, we can come on site if needed. Uh, it has not been needed yet to date. We do have a number of people who think it makes a ton of sense to um, come to San Diego to, uh, to get their training, and we're happy to host you here. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's see. I, um, uh, first pass can be used. The question was, can first pass be used to evaluate fire and ENFERS data? Uh, yes, uh, and as well as non-clinical data in general. So uh, uh, folks at Las Vegas Fire and Rescue use First Pass to look at certain kinds of calls where their response times are not what they expected, uh, where uh, there are uh, where they go out in, in, in less of an urgent nature and then they travel back hot. Um, so it's really a, uh, an internal Q, QI tool that can be used to look at your data. Um, one question is we're using an, an, basically I'll say an older version of Zoll and uh, PCR and are switching. Would it be worthwhile to implement it now or wait? Um, and I think it really depends upon what you measure. I certainly would say that it would make sense to put it in place and perhaps monitor some uh, important protocols and maybe if you're going to add more, uh, maybe wait as you're going along to, to, do, to, do, to do version 6. Uh, but you could do a universal protocol and some of the things you're doing now, um, get up to speed and then make the transition, but we can work with, with really either way. Um, it really might be a good way to gauge how successful your EPCR transformation was as well. Um, we've done a few version changes for our EPCR, and they've never gone quite as smooth as we planned ahead of time. Um, so maybe if you were testing your protocols before and after, you could do a comparison to make sure there wasn't any loss of continuity. Yeah, that's a, that's actually a really good point, Tom. I, I appreciate that. We have a fair number of people who say, oh, well, I want to get my EPCR system all dialed in and all the data right and everything working really well, and then I'll bring in first pass. And I think that's a, that's a mistake. I think we can, we can help you know what's working and what's not working. We can help you know which medics are having which kinds of problems, or maybe your medics are documenting things really well, just not as expected. Uh, by the system, and uh, I was on an EMS Compass call recently, and I use this as an example, but uh, when we looked at a particular agency and they wanted to know about which patients medics were treating as ischemic, um, we looked in the, in the correct field and there was a really small amount of compliance, and they were going to go back and spend months sort of educating their staff to document it the right way, but then when we looked, there was another field that was easier to get to that they were documenting it a lot. They were also putting it in the narrative in a way that we could pick up. And then we also went and looked at um, whether they gave uh, aspirin or nitro. And in that system and those protocols, both e either of those would indicate that that patient was ischemic. And so we had five different ways that we looked to determine if the patient was ischemic. And then from that point, we could see if they completed the bundle of care. So uh, it's not necessary at all to get your data perfect to use this, and in fact, this takes some of the pressure off of that approach. Um, here's, a, here's another great question. Um, you used the provider compliance in, their, in the evaluations. How did the crews respond to this? 
we did not use this as part of evaluations currently, and there's been concern about how crews will actually use this feedback and will it motivate change. Have you seen that the feedback given to crews is being used to improve clinical care? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question, actually. And our annual appraisal, uh, which, of course, in the end comes up hopefully with a merit raise, has a number of factors and pieces and parts to it. And clinical output is one of them. And, of course, we are using it to uh, assess uh, whether we have, you know, wh whether the provider needs some more coaching and mentoring. Um, our, and that's our scores, our percentages for the bundles by provider are actually very, very good right now, and we're very, very pleased with that. Um, but it's one of those aspects of, uh, in the same way that uh, vehicle operation, which is old, old new, new speak for driving, uh, also plays a part in that. So we have a number of factors that enable us to uh, to grade and assess an individual. Also, when we do our shift bids here, we and we once a year at least, we change our shift patterns around because, again, I come back to my point, it's not, not our emergency, it's the patient's emergency. So we relook at demand, we reset the demand, we reset, reset the schedule, and then we put it out for bid. And actually, providers get points for both seniority, and they also get points for their performance. And uh, because of that, if you are, now if you're the most senior person in the organisation, you're not going to get bumped by the most junior person in the organisation. But if you're a sort of a middle serving uh, in terms of both time and experience paramedic, actually by outperforming the guy above you, you may well be able to get his slot, and that may well be the difference between working every other weekend, every weekend, etc. And so it does play a part in our both performance and shift bid process. Um, and the folks like that because actually through hard work you can actually raise your profile. And I'll add to that. Um, the biggest part of feedback for us has just been dialogue. Um, I couldn't really quantify how much it's changed patient care because I would argue that even before we were doing any of this, our patient care was probably still excellent. What this has been more is tightening down the documentation of the patient care. As I say, what we actually do with the patient with our hands and with our drugs and with our needles and that type of stuff is 99% of the concern. Uh, the documentation of what we did does come very close behind that. Um, so I would say that's where the feedback has really come into it. To give an example, last night we had a cardiac arrest. Uh, the young lady that responded to it ended up using a non-endotracheal intubation. She used the King airway. There was no intervention listed on her PCR for attempting an endotracheal, and her narrative said ET was not able to be established. That was kind of an ambiguous statement to me, and I told her that doesn't really explain did you try and do an endotracheal innovation didn't work, or did you was there some other determination the airway was stiff or clenched or you couldn't visualize. So that's where this really comes into play because that was brought up by first pass. First pass said no advanced airway was placed because there was no intervention. And I took the call sheet back to her. I said, please provide me a sentence or two explaining did you actually try and innovate this patient or not? And I would say that's pretty much all have that's pretty much how all the feedback has gone. It's just a dialogue between me and the provider saying I didn't fully understand what happened on this call. Can you explain it a little bit better? Um, and it's it's not really my judgment on whether they did right or wrong. It's whether our patient care protocol said, um, you know, for cardiac arrest, we need to do an intubation or some other airway. Um, so it needs to be on your call sheet or clearly explained why that did or didn't happen is really how the feedback goes. Great. Um, and, and another question I think is, is, uh, is, is definitely interesting. There seem to be significant variance between raw and adjusted protocol percentages. Are you comfortable continuing to massage that manually, or do you have plans to expand automation? I actually love how that works out. Um, I've, like I said, run several thousand calls in the city, and I know how difficult it is to categorize actual patient contacts and actual EMS responses into round holes and square holes, and everything fits into a list. Everything is a very unique circumstance on an EMS call. Um, so you can't expect things to work out exactly as they do in our recipe book protocol. Um, and I think that explains why the raw number would be so low. And then I look at the call sheet, and I see that pretty much all the time, I mean, we're talking a handful of times a week, was there not a very, very legitimate reason why the test was failed for whatever reason? Um, you know, we spent 20 minutes on scene of a major trauma call. Um, so that's going to give you the very low raw score. And then I look at the call sheet, and we had the stage, or the patient was entrapped, or any of another circumstances, there were 13 patients on this call. Very, very legitimate reasons why we were 20 minutes on scene of a major trauma call. And that's why we get the adjusted score. Um, and I'm perfectly happy seeing that. And 
yes, we could tweak the first pass rule so that I don't see those calls in the first place. You know, I'm not seeing those aspirins not given for altered mental status patients because I could very well pick up the phone or type an email over to First Watch and say, hey, check the GCS score. If it's 12 or below, don't even evaluate this for me. Uh, but the fact of the matter is I don't mind looking at call sheets. If I minded looking at call sheets, I wouldn't have this job. So I'm perfectly okay having a handful of call sheets, opening them up, saying, okay, this was fine. Okay, this was fine. This one was fine, too. And then I see one that there was a problem, and I'll type an email for that. But um, at this point, it's not concerning me to see ones that end up being fine, but the technology said in the first place they were. Yeah, and and I and I think that's a that, that's a great point, Tom. I mean, each of those is a is a is a local decision. So there's a lot of fine tuning that can be done in those categories. Um, uh, on our side, that doesn't require a change on the medic side. There may also be things where you use that. You know, maybe you're constantly finding that they're 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 documenting it, but they're documenting it in a different spot. So then you actually have a choice. First pass can look both places. Then you can decide, do I want to go back and make everybody try to document it in a uniform and standard way? And what's the value of that? Or are we fine looking at both places? Or does it actually present another opportunity to review charts where something is a, is a little out of whack? And so you really can take it any way you want to. And a lot of that comes down to size of the system, volume of calls, uh, and, and your inclination to, to look at charts. Um, I will answer one of the questions, what's included with the, with the bundle? And the bundle is standard, and you can vary from it, but it's STEMI, stroke, trauma, cardiac arrest, airway management, and then either a universal or a billing trigger. But you can add protocols. Um, um, you know, we can, we can vary those. And then each of those bundles are different based on your system's protocols, meds, uh, medical director, uh, all those kind of things. Uh, here's a good one. Can you give a reasonably accurate number of tablet PCR configuration changes that were necessary to implement first pass? Did you, did you have to change your tablet PCR side to make first pass work? Uh, with that phrasing of necessary to implement first pass, I'm pretty confident we didn't have to make any. Now, we've made plenty of configuration changes, um, but please don't take this as a very defeating statement, but I don't think our configuration will ever be complete. Um, I've been in software engineering since the 90s, and I'm not sure I've ever come up with a completely finished project. There's always uh, changes to be made, improvements to be found. Um, we found that our pain documentation was very lacking. Uh, weeks after putting first pass in place, we looked at it and said, wow, our pain documentation is really uh, terrible. <laughs> it, it was about in the 20s. And I, I thought, well, there's no reason we can't be documenting our patient's pain score, uh, even if it wasn't a pain-related call. You know, if it was a breathing problem call but the patient didn't experience any pain, there's no reason that our medics can't put zero out of ten on the call sheet. Um, so that was a very easy fix. First pass uh, brought it right in front of my eyes, but that was a let's reconfigure the call sheet. Let's require that uh, pain score be filled out. Great. Yeah, just to, to add on to that, though, that the, the adjustment of certainly the EPCR also has come about, or some adjustments has come about as a result of our total quality management process, because we've realized that there is some deficiency, whether it's in a, a collective of some particular, uh, you know, uh, condition, code or something. And what we've been able to do then is because, and, and the, the, the billing department may have an issue with something that's coming through. And of course, we have this, this total quality management committee that meets monthly. We're able then on the spot to then authorize and order the changing, for example, of close call rules. And so that then help, helps us actually do our business that much, that little bit much better in the next cycle of care. So, you know, again, that total quality process with everybody in the room uh, airing their issues and, of course, you know, their various audits that they're doing helps us then test and adjust as we're going forward. Great. Uh, and um, definitely I think that's right. I think that, that it, it's very – it is really very configurable – for, for what you need, uh, and, and that's intentional because although human bodies are built the same, every EMS system is a little different, and the way people use it is a little different. And so I think it's it's uh, um, it's, it's it's very much about getting first pass to work for you and your system rather than changes. One of the questions here was how much retooling of the PCR was it? What's the time and effort to change the the the, the PCR side? I think people are conditioned for that and. You may decide to capture data differently once this is possible in your system to do, but it's but it's not necessary. It's really because you want to enhance the system. Um, 
the um, um, one of them is is in addition to the specific feedback on particular calls, do the providers see a scorecard on a regular basis so they know where they stand throughout the year as it pertains to the shift bid priority list? And one of the other questions is is just how frequently do the providers know about their overall performance rather than that you know knowing about each call on the same shift? Uh, they sure do. The first business day of each month, they get an email with their report card for the month, number of responses, number of transports, um, even to, uh, you know, very bizarre statistics such as how long did it take your ambulance to start rolling for each call as based off of your GPS, to what percentage of your calls were interfacility transports versus 911 calls, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yes, they get a regular feedback report card. I've not yet rolled in a first pass score into that, um, but at this moment, I see no reason not to. Yeah, and we've actually we, we've created the beta the beta version of that first pass score, but also things like our driving vehicle operations. We publicly publish those stats on the notice board for everybody to see, um, because again, a because actually we have some really good stats, but also sometimes that competition is a little bit healthy, uh, and we really do have nothing to hide. Yep. That's great. It's uh, worth noting that I don't actually provide a standard for any of those scores. I don't say that there's a certain number you should be at or not be at. Really, it's just there for you to compare against your peers because that is honestly what's most important to them. <laughs> How are they doing compared to their peers? Yeah. Um, one question is what layers of staff use the program? All levels, middle management, and upper, just Tom? Uh, just me and our current implementation of it. Yeah. So I think in a lot of places there there are, there are one or two people who do the QI like in most systems, and then um, you know upper management, other other leaders uh, outside of the quality department will see the results, um, the reports, the overall things. So that's 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 pretty common. Um, there's a question I think. Um, you know, do you pull at random reports that return a hundred percent successful test? to analyze the continued accuracy of the first pass system? If so, how accurately do you find that the first pass system is accurately analyzing your medic's performance? And how often have you found the system having not been as accurate as you would like it to be? Uh, we do have a separate uh, process of random sampling, but not expressly for that purpose of evaluating the accuracy of first pass. Um, from a nuts and bolts standpoint, I don't really have any reason to doubt the validity of what first pass is showing, but to answer the question, yes, we do have uh, about a dozen PCRs that are evaluated daily separate from the first pass process, um, you know, for other purposes. Uh, we don't currently have any first pass protocol for signature compliance because that would be that'd be some amazing technology if it could evaluate the image field of the signature. Um, so, yes, we do have separate processes other than that. Um, but not for that purpose of uh, doing quality assurance on the quality assurance program. Yeah, uh, no pressure on the signature piece, Todd. Yeah, yeah, no, I think actually there. But you know, what's interesting is we do have folks that are at least checking to see if the signature is there. Um, you know, is the you know was the field filled out? And I think that's a that's a that's a, a thing that for a lot of people they can't even they can't even do that. And then I I would say secondly, part of the Tom's uh, comfort and Rob's comfort is probably because the the setup process for each question is validated along the way. And so you're really, if you're checking um, reports later on, it, it's really to see if, if something has changed in your system because the, the code won't change. And that's a great idea. I think there's actually, a, a, would be interesting to, to look at that from a, um, um, uh, putting them in a, in a separate queue kind of a status within FirstPass to, to really randomly pull them out. Or maybe you just want to randomly pull out calls that seem to pass from new medics. Uh, that you want to keep a closer eye on. It's a, that's, a, that's a really good point. Um, so I think we should probably wrap up here. Uh, if there are questions that we can answer uh, uh, by reaching out or, or by email, um, uh, or then we will certainly do that. Please feel free. I've got on the screen um, uh, Rob and Tom both uh, graciously offered their email up uh, to, uh, to, to take uh, any, any questions or information. Uh, we're happy to do that. You'll get a follow-up email with a link to the recording. And uh, I would say, uh, Rob or Tom, is there anything you have to add as we close up? Uh, for me, no. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about uh, what it is that we do. And uh, the email's there. By all means, uh, folk, please uh, email and ask any questions. 
Awesome. Well, thank you both for your time. I really appreciate you sharing your, your experience. And I think what is nice is that, is that you really got in and started to do some things. And, and I think that's, uh, that's probably my, my favorite part of, of, of the whole thing is it's really run like a lot of other things in EMS where, you know, we get in and we, and we do and we change and we learn and we, and we grow and we act. And, and I think that that's really resulted in a very fast implementation there for you folks. And, and I just can't thank you enough for your support. Uh, thanks, everybody else, for your time. If you have any questions, give us a shout, and uh, we'll be reaching out, and uh, we really appreciate everybody giving so much of their day. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Tom. Thanks.